is up is I'm actually speaking at this event. Uh, I believe Ken as well. We're talking about Azure, more cloud stuff at that event. I'll be talking about uh, using cloud and mobile development at that event. So um, it's a little bit more pricey, but if you want to go to a more professional level conference, definitely do check that out. Uh, they keep mentioning about the Montreal Jazz Festival, so I'm thinking that's going to be a good, good time for us. So definitely do check that out. Okay, so let me walk through the schedule. So we've got a bit of a change on the schedule. Um, we don't have our second speaker. So what we're going to do is basically, uh, Jeff has agreed to kind of put more content into his talk. So hopefully by about 10.30 we can kind of wrap up, give you guys a bit of break. Because we got plenty of coffee, water, and food down there. You saw all the food, so please eat that up. And if you haven't visited the swag table and picked up a shirt, do so. Um, welcome to this talk. Uh, welcome to Let's Dev This London. This is exciting. I think this is the first time that uh, we've had something like this, right, but, Tom? You know, London? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. All right. So a little bit about myself, if you, for those of you that don't know me, which is probably everybody in this room. My name is Lori Lalonde, and I'm an independent consultant. Um, I am a Microsoft MVP, Xamarin MVP, and a Xamarin Certified Developer. I've written a couple of books, they're obsolete now. I'm <laughs> part of the Western Devs Group. We're a group of passionate developers. We blog, we record podcasts, we speak at conferences and user groups. Check us out on westerndevs.com. I run my own user group in Kitchener, Waterloo. Some of you attended, I've, se I've seen you there before. And if you need to contact me, there's my information. Last but not least, <laughs> this is the love of my life. I absolutely adore my dog. My daughter and my boyfriend don't appreciate that, but she comes first. So I just thought I'd give her a little plug there. Tom mentioned her in the beginning. All right, so now let's get back to business. So we're here to talk about localization. Now, how many people here have actually employed localization in applications, websites, or things that they've worked on? Half the room. Okay, great. What technologies were you using? Like, were you in web applications? Um, like Currently web applications, yes. And what were you using for localization? Um, trying to use Bootstrap to get it to work everywhere. Okay, cool. All right. How about you? Language, just internationalization issues. Language content. Okay, excellent. So hopefully this talk, you'll, you'll get something out of it. Uh, I'm more focused on the mobile aspect of it, so mobile applications, but uh, again, this is a strategy that you can use in any .NET application that you're using. But first we'll talk about the mobile side, which isn't relevant to anything else. Um, so why should I care? Why is localization important? Generally when you're starting work on a, on a website or an application and you're not sure of your target market, you think, well, what's the big deal? I'll just code in English now. And if there's a need for you know, multiple languages, I'll deal with that later. But essentially, if you're not thinking about um, supporting other languages from the get-go, you're closing out a huge portion of your target market, right? North America English is just you know one language of many that are across the, the world. And even if you don't plan on supporting it today, you want to set up your application, design your you know design it in such a way that it you can easily plug in languages later, and then that reduces a lot of the headache. So in Xamarin, you can target Android and iOS um, applications. And with that, you can still use the native localization that is um, part of the, those platforms. With Android, it's as simple as plugging in your strings files, following a convention. So in Android, the operating system, when it's running and booting up and launching the application, it's definitely looking for um, values or for files that are in this, that are in the resources directory. Essentially, they have to be under resources and values. And for each language you're supporting, you have to create a subsequent values directory with a, the suffix of the language code that you're supporting. Now, it can be the two language or the four language uh, you know, code, depending on what you want to do. In this example, I'm just saying I'm supporting Spanish and French. I don't care about the region, but I'm just supporting those languages. I don't have any region-specific translations I want to include. But say, you know, between French, there's you know, Paris French, there's French Canadian, and sometimes there's translations that are specific to those regions. I can then include another directory there for like those regions specifically, and then only translate the values that are different there. Okay. 
Now the strings files it is an XML format. Um, so you definitely have to include that and follow that format. It's very straightforward and easy, uh, easy to do. Now with image files, you, again, you have to follow the same format. You're placing your localized images in a directory structure that Android will recognize. And in this case, it's the drawable directory. Okay. Now on top of adding uh, images into your Android application, you also have to add images that not only support multiple languages, but support multiple resolutions. So now you've just compounded your problem, right? You have a lot of things to consider. And so because of this, I highly recommend not localizing images if you can help it. Try and include generic images where you can just place text over top of it uh, in lieu of actually having the text embedded within the image. So simply because of this problem, because this can grow pretty quickly. And then you can have an app that has so many images in it and it just bloats up your, your APK or your IPA, depending. Um, if it's Android or iOS. When you're including images, make sure you set the build action, obviously, to um, Android resource. If you're automatically adding those images in through Visual Studio or Xamarin Studio, it sets it up by default for you. But if you're ever having problems where it's not picking it up, that's probably the first thing you want to check. Make sure your build action is set appropriately. Now, to access those resources, there's one of two ways you can do it. In Android, you can access it through the markup or in code behind. How many people here have experience with Android development? Yeah, okay, so, so you guys know what I'm talking about. <laughs> now in Xamarin uh, Android, the XML layout file of an Android file is exactly the same as it is in a native Android file that you've written in Java. You can take an, an, the Android markup you have in an existing application in, in Android Studio, copy it and paste it into an XML file in Visual Studio, and it's exactly the same markup. So you, this should be familiar too. There's no changes there. Um, so again, you can reference your strings um, in markup by uh, pending at string and then the unique ID of the string that you want to reference. And then for drawables, it's the same way. At drawable with the the name of the drawable uh, that you got in the folder. Now the reason I don't have to add any kind of um, suffix to images here is because when you're compiling an Android application and you include resources, Android generates a unique identifier which it uses to associate uh, what, you're, what you're calling it here to the actual resource that you added. So every time you're adding new images or new uh, text files or styles or things like that into your Android project and you build, you'll notice that there's a resource designer uh, file that gets regenerated and it'll have a bunch of unique IDs in there and that's, it ties it all together that way. And you'll see in code how you can access that, which is right below it. So in code, you essentially call resources.getString to retrieve your string files. And this resource.string.greeting is that unique ID. So that's, that's just an integer, which is a reference to the actual um, string resource that you're, 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 you're wanting to reference. And then for images, you can set background resource to the drawable. And again, there's a unique identifier that's an integer value that you can use to reference your drawable ID. Now for iOS, very similar, you're still following a convention. You still have to place things in the right location in order for iOS to pick it up. And then once you do, you're off to the races. In this case, under the resources folder, you'll have a bunch of directories that are suffix.lproj. And so base.lproj is where your defaults go, um, any, like your default language, whatever your default language is that you define. It doesn't have to be English, it can be any language that you think is the main language. And then any other uh, languages that you want to support, you have to create a .lproj file with a suffix or with a prefix of the language code and region and or region. So it's up to you. Now the difference here is in Android, the images and the strings are kept in separate directories and in iOS they're in the same directory. So your lproj will contain both your string resources and your image resources. Okay. And the, for, the file format there is pure key value pair strings. It's not XML like Android. And so that's just, again, the images uh, are in the same directory, but the difference is your build action is a bundle resource in, in your iOS applications. Very straightforward. Now with iOS, the only way you can access your 
localized images and text is in code pine, which isn't very nice, but it is what it is, so you have to deal with it. Um, in order to access your string resources, you have to access them through the, the bundle. So there's uh, an object NS bundle, which exposes main bundle, which then exposes localized string. And you can pass in the key of your, your string resource. And the second parameter there is just an optional comment. It doesn't show up anywhere. It's probably just likely for people, like for developers working in code. But all you really care about is getting the key right, which is the first parameter that you're passing in. And then to retrieve images, you use uh, the static method call off of UI image from bundle. So, and then you pass in the, the key of your image resource there. Now, if you notice at the top, this is something that I haven't gotten to yet. I'm accessing the, the application title in a different way. And that's because the application title is stored in an info p list under, um, under the key of CF bundle display name. So it's a separate uh, strings file, still key value format, <coughs> a key, key value pair. Um, but in order for the t application title to be localized, I can't just throw it into my own strings file and, and use it. I actually have to set the CF bundle display name in order for it to appear both like in the icon label and on the springboard when someone's launching the app, and if I'm accessing the app, right? I can create a separate one if I want, but then my icon on my springboard is not going to represent that that text, and it's always going to stay whatever the default language is. So in this way, the, the icon label will change. Now with Android and iOS, you have to make sure that any string re resources you're defining, you escape certain characters, and that's the quote, the backslash, and the line characters. You can't get around that. It's a little bit dirty, but it is what it is. So the problems with using the native approach when you're targeting multiple platforms is now you're in a situation where you have to support multiple files and multiple projects in different formats. So in iOS, I have strings files that are key value pairs. In Android, I have these XML files. They're all, it's, they're all still the same you know, keys and, and values. Like I'm still creating an app that's gonna look the same on iOS and Android, it's gonna use all the same strings. But now I have more files to, to maintain and more files to send to translators to deal with. And it just becomes a real mess. So in respect, with respect to that, we're thinking, okay, well, what's a better way? What's an optimal way in Xamarin to target multiple platforms and still localize the application without creating a lot of headache and work for myself and any other developers that are maintaining this application? Well. .NET's amazing, and .NET has built-in uh, libraries for localization, and uh, they're called resource files. So how many people here have used resource files, .resx files? Perfect. So you're already half the way there. So you can create these resource files in something that's called a portable class library. And what a portable class library is, is a library that you can reuse uh, among your mobile applications. So you can set the targets on it. It's just like a regular class library, except you have the option to say, I'm gonna target Android, I'm gonna target iOS, I'm gonna target Windows. So you can pick what platforms you're gonna target. And the more platforms you pick, the smaller of a window of reusable uh, APIs you have that are common across all platforms. So essentially you're just saying, I'm gonna target these platforms, so let me use anything that applies across all three. You know what I mean? So that, that way I have a common set of APIs I can access. And luckily, doing that, I still have access to use resource files and the localization and resource manager that's, that's built into the .NET framework. So you have your resource files and you're gonna use a resource manager to load the string. So you just create like a helper class to do that. And it really is just a few lines of code. It's really straightforward. You can pass in the key and the culture uh, that you want to set, or that you want your, you know, which language you want returned, and then it returns you a string value. Very easy to do. So it's really nice that way. It's very clean, and it gives you uh, more flexibility, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a little bit. So if you haven't worked with resource files, essentially it is a name value pair that you can enter into this nice little designer window, but if you actually open it in a text editor, you'll notice it's all XML format. 
So you have a nice designer to work with to set up your string values, but it, it is rendered in XML format for that. So as I mentioned, the advantages. Now you can use one set of files across all platforms. You have a set of files that are easy for translators to work with because there's third-party tools like the ResX Manager, which gives them a simple user interface that loads up these resource files in kind of like a spreadsheet format. And they can add languages and they can add the translations. And all the changes they're making in this tool ends up rewriting the ResX files or adding new ResX files. And then they just package it all up and send it to back to you. And then they, they don't have any trouble dealing with it. And there's no question that all the translations were, were handled. And you don't have them doing that for multiple platforms. They only have to do it one time. So it's really nice that way. And another, op another option that's, or another opportunity that it provides you is if you're developing using Xamarin Forms, it gives you the opportunity to use data binding. So Xamarin Forms, for those of you that aren't familiar with it, um, enables you to add, create views in the portable class library using XAML markup. And when your application is compiled, that view is compiled into the native views for each platform. So you can create a simple view in your portable class library that says it has a button, text field, or whatever you want. And when you're compiling it on native, um, Android, it will actually be the Android button and text uh, box or label or, thing, or whatever control you're picking. And on iOS, it'll be like a UI button or UI um, edit or UI text view, whatever it is. And on Windows, it'll be the text box. And so it's the native controls. It's not a hybrid uh, application at that point. Xamarin, and a lot of people are confused that Xamarin Forms may be hybrid. It is not. It, is, it totally renders down to native, the native controls. But you also have that ability to do data binding, which is something that I love to do. I'm a WPF uh, developer. I'm a Silverlight developer. I'm a Windows Phone developer. Well, not more than a Windows Phone developer. But uh, you know, universal Windows platform developer. So data binding is like at the bread, you know, the heart of it. That's our bread and butter. And we absolutely Amen. love it. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I'll get off my soapbox there. But yeah, anything to reduce code behind, it's amazing. So the drawbacks here, I mean, there are some drawbacks, obviously, because you are using something and, you know, you are, I guess the grass is not always green on the other side, but it's, it's better and you have to have that trade-off. And in this case, your application name will not be localized. And so in that case, you know, well, then you may have to still, con you know, add in your platform-specific resource files just to make sure your application name. I mean, that's a minor trade-off. I don't think that's big of a, as big of a deal. Once you have your application name localized once, you're set. Do you need to localize your application name? Because, I mean, they don't, they don't change Word, the name Word, for when it's a French version of Word, do they? It's up to you, right? Some applications do, some applications don't, right? It's up to you. If you feel like the icon that you have as your application is representative enough and users are familiar with it, like Facebook, right? You see the F and you know it's Facebook, so whatever language you're translating it into, you're still going to see that big F icon and you know what it is. I don't know. Um, but if you're if it's a fairly new application and users aren't familiar with it, um, and you, they may switch languages and then, oh, how do I find that application? What was its name? I don't know. But maybe they, they do know. I don't know. I just, I prefer that if it's a name that's kind of a derived name of, that you have of letters and numbers, it's really funky and weird, obviously you're not going to translate it. But if it's straight up English, it might, it might be worthwhile. Right? Especially if you're in the application and you're referencing it. And then it's going to look weird with other kind of this English word intermingled with um, the localized phrases. It's up to you. It's, uh, it's all brand. It's all, it all depends. And if it's a trade yeah, and if, if it's a trademark name, like, yeah, then you have to stick with it, right? You're not going to move it, but it all depends. So let's take a look at what this looks like in code. To do is that I have this project, and I just have three, or I have this case with three projects in it. I have a portable class library, which I mentioned before. I have an Android-specific project and an iOS-specific project. Now, with my portable class library, just quickly show you. This is what I was talking about as far as the targets. 
So in this case, my portable class library will support Windows 8 applications, Windows Phone 8 applications, Android and iOS applications, and even ASP.NET Core. So like, even just if you develop even a web application and you want to include a portable class library just to make use of some of this reusable code, you can. So in my portable class library, I have two resource files, a French, res a French language file and an English language file. And it just has a few translations in it. So, no big deal, right? My French resource file, it has the name and then it has the suffix of the language code that I'm supporting and then dot res. So there you go. So I have a few few languages in there, a few, few strings that I'm translating. And now I have this translation helper class. And this is really what's going to do the work of deciding what, um, what I'm bringing back. Okay. So in here you can see I have one method, a static method, just get string, and it accepts a key uh, string parameter and a culture info object. So I'm just saying, tell me what key you want, tell me what language you want it in, and then I'm going to give it back to you. And then I just make use of the resource manager to retrieve that value and return it back to the user. It's very straightforward. And notice that I have to reference the resource file by its full um, full name, like namespace, path, everything. So localization demo dot resources dot app resources. That's where it resides. So when it gets built, that's what it's going to get built as. It's going to reference. It's going to recognize that that as the namespace. So it'll pull the right assembly in so I can uh, access my resource manager, and then I'll call get string. Now let's take a look at the platform specific side of things. So this is my Android project and right here I have my draw folder. So for French I have an icon and a stop sign. Okay. You can see that? Perfect. And then for English again I have the English version of the icon and a stop sign. And as you can see, I have my values directory under resources, and that's going to contain my strings file. So I mentioned before that the strings file is an XML format. So let's take a look at how that is. And I'm just using the strings file simply for the application name. That's just an example of this is a, I only need the application name translated. All my other translations are being handled in the portable class library. So it's 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 not ideal, but I wanted to, to show you a demo of localizing the application name, so that's why it's in there. And then the main activity file is really where I do a lot of the work. So I'm pulling, I'm retrieving uh, handles to my, to my form elements, because I'm gonna set them in code to whatever values it returned back from the translation helper. Okay, there's no data binding here. There are frameworks where you can use where you can incorporate data binding in your Android project. It's called MVVM Cross, but that's just too much overload for this type, for this talk. I just wanted to keep it simple. So I'm setting everything in code behind. But know that it's out there if you are interested in looking at that. So I retrieve handles to my form elements. Great. Now I want to know what's the current culture that the device is set at. And obviously this is platform specific, so this is why this is on the Android side of things. I have to figure out what's my Android device set to, what language is that the user is using it in. And I can simply do that by referencing the static variable local.default in the Java user library. Right? Now the Android locale is returned as language code underscore region code. But .NET expects language code hyphen region code. So I have to do a little string replace here just to replace that underscore with a hyphen. So when I'm passing, when I'm creating my culture info object, 
it knows what language and region I want. And I simply do that here, so I create my culture info object, and I return it back um, to the method that I'm calling it. Great. So now I gotta actually pull out those resources from the, uh, from the portable class library. I'm gonna use my translation helper class to do it, so I simply call translation helper .get string static method, and pass in the key, and then pass in that culture info object I just got, so that it knows what language to use. So it's pretty straightforward. So here I am, application title, greeting. I mean, I could have gone a step further and moved those key values into like a constants file, so I don't have strings just random strings throughout my application uh, because I don't like that. Um, but for now, it's for simplicity. It's just passing the key value in, and I'm setting my background resource. Again, this is not use, making use of the translation helper at all. So I'm still setting my images in the platform specific way because I have to keep my images in the platform specific library because Android and iOS support different resolutions and so it's better to keep your files. Um, How are you adding the translation helper? Like you said, from reference, just adding it as a reference? Oh, yes. Good question. Yes. So, I'm referencing my portable class library here. So in my Android project, I'm making a reference to my localization demo portable class library. And then I just have, um, well, I think it's in the same namespace. Yeah, it's in, it's in the localization demo namespace, which is what this is all part of. So because I'm referencing it, and really it's part of the same namespace, I have access to it. But yeah, so I'm setting my images still in the platform specific way. I can't get around that. Uh, that's generally the, the best practice. Okay, so let's give this a run and see how it looks. This is my actual device, by the way. Yeah, moving it, picture moves, pretty awesome. So I have just a very simple app. I have the title that's also being displayed within the app, just so I could show you that it is being localized. Uh, my, my image and some text. So now I'm gonna go into the settings, and I'm gonna change the language. French, that's the language that's supporting. And one thing I want you to notice right off the bat, and the icon's at the bottom. So there's the icon. Notice that the text is now in French, but the icon is still the English icon. In order to get the French icon to display, I have to reboot my device. And now when it reboots, it will come back as French. So I will do that, and while that's rebooting, I'll show you the iOS side of things that I'm not delaying just for the sake of delaying. I don't do that just to annoy people. So we'll run the iOS application. What software are you using to mirror your device onto the screen? Visor. Okay. So I will run the iOS application, and then I will go through the iOS code with you once once I have it con connected back to the main machine. So again, just very simple localization demo, stop in the name of love. And now I'm going to change the settings. I don't know if 
you can really see it, but the title itself is localized. It just cuts off after like 11 characters. But the icon, again, is not localized. In this case, I can reboot it, but it's not going to matter because it already rebooted. You watched it reboot. There's a bug on iOS that is not pulling this in. And it's something that I've done research on to find an answer to, but apparently there's no answer to it yet. So you're not going to have a localized icon, which is kind of a bummer, but you can at least localize the app. So just know that that's a quirk that happens. It's, it is what it is. So let me grab this now. another bug. In the simulator, and only in the simulator, if I set it to French without a region, it automatically attends the U.S. So it says there is no FR-US language. So then it, it crashes. It doesn't happen on a device, it only happens on the simulator. And again, that's another quirk. So we have to change that to make sure you select French with a region so it just doesn't append the U.S. as a default. I don't know why it does that. My code doesn't do that to it, it just happens. So, go home. Now we'll watch it, and we're off to the races. So we got my app title, got my image, and I've got the rest of the text that's being translated. <coughs> Excellent. So we know that that works. Except for the icon, but that's out of my control. So sorry. Get this back up and refresh the connection. <clears throat> okay, now the whole purpose of this reboot, if anyone remembers, was to see that the icon actually does change. So you can see now. Just on a simple reboot, now the icon is changed and the, the title is still French. So awesome, right? That's great. Not ideal that the user would have to reboot to see the icon, but whatever. Like, I don't know. I don't know how you get around that. Um, that's great. So we saw that on, on the Android code for that. We saw how it works on iOS. Let's actually take a little bit of a deeper look at the iOS code. Similar to Android, I have to reference my portable class library in my project. So that's the first thing. And then we have these, the LCrouch files. Okay. So in my LCrouch file, I have my icon, which doesn't matter because it didn't work. It only showed the default one. And my stop sign image. That's all I have. I didn't have anything else. French, I have the icon, and I have my stop sign image. But I also have this info plist string. And that was only for the application title. Remember, I have to set the CF with the bundle display name in order to localize the application title. And that's the only translation that I have here. To prove it to you, there you go. All the other translations are in the portable class library. And that's what it's using. I'm gonna open up my P list, info P list just in a so what I wanted to show you with the info plist is <laughs> the CF bundle display name um, is the default name of your app, uh, but the CF bundle display name is which actually shows in the springboard, and that's the one that I, I want to localize. So I have created other another springs file in order to localize that. And the other thing you have to also include is the languages that you are supporting. So you have to make sure that you set your default region in this key called CF Bundle Development Region and 
set what like which which languages that you're supporting as an as an array of strings. So my CF bundle localizations array has to contain the additional languages I'm supporting. And in this case, it's only French, which is fine. So I have my default language, and then I have the, uh, the, the other language that I'm supporting, and whatever other ones I would include there as well. And I have my icon files that are, that are listed. Now, what do you notice that's different about this info plist in comparison to the info plist that's in the Alproj file? Is nobody paying attention? Nobody cares. Okay, let's take a look at the other info plist file. It's not really an info plist file, it's just a strings file. It's called info plist, but it's the strings file which just has the localized name of the text, or of, the, of the application. So it's just key value pair. It's actually a .strings file. Or the, the original, the actual info .plist file is actually an Cool? All right. Just keep that in mind when you're when you're working on things and you, you don't get confused um, when you're wondering why you have to write it in a different format. That's just how it is. So now in my one view controller in this application, here's how I'm referencing the code. So just pulling out the title. From the main bundle, because it's part of info plist, I can use object for info dictionary and reference the key name. So I got the application title. The image again is platform specific, nothing's different there. I'm still using UI image from bundle. And then for my message label, I'm usually I'm using translation helper. And that's my portable class library. So it's still using the same <coughs> string that the Android application was using. I also have a get current culture info method here. But the reason it's here and not in the portable class library is the same reason it was in Android. It's using the device specific APIs to gather what the current culture info is. So it has to be in the platform specific project. In this case, it's a, it's a matter of just retrieving the first language in the preferred languages array. I know it seems really hacky and I hated it. I'm like, this can't be the right way. This, this can't be it. But clearly, like this is the way to access what the default language is set as. The first item in the preferred language is array. Yay. IOS. Okay. <coughs> so, awesome. Now, the one other thing that I wanted to bring up, and I'm actually, do I have time to show you? I have 10 minutes. Let's see if I can do this in 10 minutes. Um, the thing that I like approach is that I'm passing this culture info into the translation helper class is that it doesn't confine me to using the device specific language and then I have had this request at multiple client sites when we're developing applications they want a settings page and they want the user to be able to select a language and then they want the language to take effect so they only want the language affected in the like changed in the application they don't care what the device is set at they want the user to be able to select it in the application and so this affords me the opportunity to do that because right now I'm just passing a culture info to the to the method call every time I'm calling it. It doesn't care how I got that culture info. It doesn't care if I got it from the device or if I got it, you know, I just derived it in code. Whereas if I'm using the native implementations of pulling out languages, it uses the device specific culture, and I have to do some uh, you know crazy workaround when I'm loading the application in order to get it to, to default to something else, probably without the application. So I'll do, I'll, I'll show a quick demo of just kind of changing it on the fly and show you a quirk that happens with it so that you can kind of understand that, you know, sometimes these quirks happen and, and how to get around it. So luckily I do have a text file where I can just bring in the code that I coded this morning. To bring in that cell. Okay. All right. So we're going to add a checkbox to the main view. Okay. Right. Okay. 
So I'm gonna, I'm gonna create this text box and then every time I check it, it's just gonna change the language to French. And when I uncheck it, it's gonna go back to English. It's gonna be very straightforward just to demonstrate that concept. Have that, pull it out. method so every time it's clicked it's going to call init form elements which does that check for what's the current language and then setting the text and the images device language or not, right? Okay. This white space is annoying me. All right. No. Cancel. Cancel. I don't want to do it, I was. Forgot to set the default. Okay. So we're going to set the default project back to Android. I just coded that this morning. So I was like, I want to try this in the demo and see how that goes. But I, I didn't want to start with it. So the easy guys in. Oh wait, I'm already in French. I gotta, I gotta change this back to English. Do your checkbox. No, I have the checkbox. It's, it's just to change to French only. Oh, but I guess I could have changed the code. <coughs> I could have changed the code. Okay. So it's displaying in English, has my French tech box. Pretend we're in a settings page, we're like, yeah, French, awesome. What do you notice that's wrong with this picture? The image hasn't changed. Android's amazing. So in order to change the image, I actually have to force the activity to, to restart. So I have to do a finish and then start activity. But because this is the main activity, this is the only activity, can't really do that here. So I'd actually have to close the app, restart it. And if I was saving this um, check state, check that, and then load the image, and then it would work. So that's a gotcha that, that I came across at a client site when we were um, localizing an application and finding out that a lot of these images were not kind of switching over. And something similar happens in iOS. So in iOS, what was happening there was very similar as that the strings weren't, weren't changing and uh, the view controller that was already loaded. And so again, you'd have to kind of refresh it in some way. So when you're doing on-the-fly translations, be aware of little gotchas like that, things that could come up that could bite you, uh, or that may not be working, don't assume they're working. So there are, there are pros and cons to doing in-app language switching, uh, but there will be a lot more testing involved because of it. So just be aware of that. And also, in the app language switching, you won't have the benefit of having your language title changed on the springboard. That's a device-specific setting, so that you'll only see that there. Is it possible to do an app initialization when the user opens the app, that they can pick the language before the images are affected? Like, it could load? I mean, on first launch, if you want to prompt them for a desired language, you can. Um, generally, that's in a settings page of some sort. So then when you're at the settings page and they change it, it's easy yeah. enough to, but you're going back, you, when, when, you're, when you're going back, you're refreshing the activity anyways, it's doing an on restart and reloading things. So that won't happen, but because I'm doing it on the same page, it's not right. triggering, right? So things are just kind of triggering just right. So yeah, so that's that. And we'll go back to the slide deck. Awesome. You crash this minute. 
It just like totally crashed. PowerPoint crashed. No, she'll run it. It's on the taskbar. Uh, it's got nothing to do with the display or anything. Switch screens on you? Yeah, PowerPoint crashed on me. Stupid PowerPoint. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I'll make this really quick because I know I don't have that much time. So another option that you have, if you don't like the idea of using resource files because they're in XML format and you're allergic to XML, you can use JSON. Um, but you'd have to create your own web service provider, like a web, web API, which you can call, which will turn your JSON strings of translation, translations, and then you can use it that way. And you can still apply the same kind of concept of having a translation helper in your portable class library um, to, to return the strings to your platform-specific project. And you're off to the races, really. It's pretty straightforward, easy to do. And I've done it that way as well. And it's pretty quick because we download, you're downloading the JSON as the application is loading. And it's not, a, you know, it's not very slow. It's pretty fast. And the user doesn't even notice any latency, especially if you're, because you're using a sync in a way, which I hope you all are. Um, definitely, that's the way to go. Just kind of load, load that up in the background as the application is loading. Don't walk up the UI. Platforms, it's pretty generic. You only download the translation file you need, so you don't have to package up all the languages at one time in your APK or IPA. And if you have any like misspelled words in your translations, you can fix them on the fly and the user will get them the next time they load up the app. So you can kind of version your language, language files that way. But if you add new translations, obviously you're going to have to push out an update because your application won't know about those new, those new keys that you're adding in and where to use them. Right? But if you have to fix any existing translations, easy peasy. And again, support it in Xamarin Forms because you can create properties, you can data bind. It's all good. So again, the drawbacks, the application name won't be localized. You'll have to still do that workaround that, we that I showed you with the resource files. And it is dependent on network connectivity. So if the user is working offline and they decide to switch languages, well, they're out of luck. Um, because they don't, you don't have all the languages at hand. Um, but how often are users working offline or if they have a poor connection or if the connection drops? There could be problems there. So you got to think about that, those kinds of things when you're deciding on a localization strategy for your application. And last but not least, JSON is foreign to translators, okay? <laughs> like, not, no pun intended, but translators, <laughs> they're not developers. They're looking at JSON and like, what is this? What like, is this? There's craziness. nothing easy to work, work with. There's no tool out there that I know of that's easy for translators to use with JSON formats. Um, so you might want to develop one and send it to them so they can use it <laughs> if you want to use JSON. So they don't have that same kind of translation <laughs> service add-in. I know Visual Studio has yeah. that translation where you can send it off. And it's in a format they understand, you get it back, and you can just kind of use it. With I haven't seen one yet. Mm. But if you come across one, let me know, because I'd love to add that to my presentation. Okay. Maybe. 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 Well, no, I'm just taking some of the extensions there. Well, that's no problem. It's no problem. No, it's a good conversation to have. But yeah, if you find, find one. Yeah. So your general considerations, these are things that you know I ab absolutely hope that you can, that you were thinking about as I'm talking about this topic. And these are the conclusions that you came to already but before we got to this slide, because that was the point. Um, definitely design your app to support multiple languages, even if you're only going with English off the get-go, because it will make life easier down the road when you do have to support multiple languages. And if you, it will be inevitable, trust me. <coughs> Never hard code strings in your code or your views, whatever. Like, no circumstances should that ever be allowed. Even if you don't think you'll ever support multiple languages, just don't do it. Store, store your strings in resource files and avoid string concatenation because nothing translates the same way that it's spoken in your main <laughs> language, right? Don't think that you're gonna have placeholders in a sentence and it's all gonna mesh together well. Like, translate the whole sentence, all or none. Do you know what I mean? And ensure your UI is flexible enough to adapt to different languages. We didn't really touch on that today, but make sure that you don't have fixed widths and fixed heights. Make sure that it supports left to right and right to left, and that the, the fields that you're showing these, the, this information in will you know, grow to accommodate the, the text that you're using. And sometimes that can be tricky, because especially if you're, you're talking about buttons and labels on a button, like something as simple as the word cancel or um, close this or you know I accept the terms of service 
you'd be amazing when you when you when you select certain languages where the string is super long and you're like, this is just one word. What happened? And then it gets like cut off or you know, kind of like you get to see the ellipsis or something. You, you don't want that. So you make sure you definitely test for things like that. You set your font size accordingly to, to adjust to that and uh, definitely do UI testing. UI testing is heavy, heavy on here. And you want to maybe set up some automated UI tests to do that. Um, make sure that you're, you're always running those through so you're always verifying that UI looks good regardless of the language that it's, that's um, being set in. Just some kind of a library where you uh, have the most common translations into the most common languages. The, the translation for the most common phrases in the most common languages. I don't know, I agree, for example, that's really cool. Like 15 languages. You know what would be awesome is if you developed an extension or a Visual Studio plugin that had that people can use. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, I don't know of one, but we need to see if there's someone, someone's provided something like that, like through open source or mm -hmm. through some sort of extension. So that would be neat that you just have like a basic, your, it's kind of like your basic set of translations off the get-go. Because yeah, you're right. Most applications have, you know, cancel, save, I agree, you know, terms of service and privacy policy and things like that. That would be neat that if there was something out there like that that just already had that available in multiple languages, so you have a set of translations you can automatically build. Mm -hmm. There is a multilingual app toolkit which you can use, and that's, you know, you type in your translate your, your English terms, and then, yeah. you sit, and then it will provide you translations for whatever language you like. So it'll generate them on the spot, the but it doesn't give you a base set to work with. Is the, you gotta be careful with that, because you say French, is it French in that local dialect? Because there's some slang <laughs> terms? Yeah, I haven't used it specifically. Yeah. Every client I've been at, they hire translators. But if you're an independent, you're an independent hobbyist or just a student, and you're yeah. just trying to play around with it. Multilingual app toolkit, uh, definitely add install that, and that's right within Visual Studio. So, yeah. and then you can incorporate that in your app, and it'll generate all the resource files you need, um, and in the, in the languages that you want, based on your translation. So it, it'll translate. I believe behind the scenes, it uses Bing's. It's, it uses the Bing translation service to come up with those translations. So they may not be 100% accurate depending on what you're translating, but they'll be close enough. There are some, I don't know the names, but when I was at Build the one year, there were some translating companies that you could send their files, and they understood JSON and XML, so you could send the files to them and then send it back to oh, them. Oh, nice. Yeah. That's awesome. If you ever, if you come up with the name of that, maybe send it. I'll see if I can dig up the cards. Or for post it, it on, uh, yeah. on the Meetup page. Yeah, I'll look it up, yeah. How about this uh, <clears throat> recent uh, artificial intelligent bots that do like uh, intelligent assistant, yeah, for like live conversation application? I think it's trivial to adapt that to, to these requirements. I don't know exactly what the status of that. Are you talking about like the Skype translation where you're talking and yeah. it translates on the fly? That's really cool. Like, I think that's neat. Has anyone here tried that? The Skype where you can talk to someone in a different, uh, who's, who's, who speaks a different language, and you speak your language and it translates for them on the fly, what you're saying, and vice versa. No, I haven't tried that. No. It's like Star Trek. It's pretty cool. <laughs> Laurent told me he tried it. He said there was some latency, and, yeah. but he said it was pretty decent. I believe it was Laurent who told me he tried it. But yeah, that's a whole new level of applying localization, which is really cool. Like, Yeah, and I, I bet you it does use Luis, like uh, the language. Um, Forget. Language, what's it stand for? Lewis, L O L U I S by Microsoft. I forget what the acronym stands for, or, but it's for language translation um, hmm. or language recognition, but I thought more so in a different way. But they call these bots, yeah? Intelligent bots. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Are there any other questions? Uh, general localization question. You said avoid string concatenation. What about concatenating a non localized string, like the name of the user or? Date or something like that. Is there a better way to do that? Or? Well, essentially, with the name of the user, you're just going to show their name. And if you're going to show it in a phrase, mm -hmm. then have that phrase, the full phrase in your string with a placeholder in it. And then you just do a string format inserting <coughs> like, the name at runtime. But you don't. what you don't want to do is have hello and then the user's name, and then assume that you're just translating hello and then the user's name and then you append something else. So you don't want to do string, string concatenation in C, in C sharp. 
you want to just have the full phrase in the resource file and just put the placeholder where you need to insert a name or a date. Is there a recommended placeholder to use or just the default.net kind of smoothly bracket? It's the default that, yeah. There's zero, one, yeah, two. Yeah. More so be, uh, because, yeah, if you're trying to do that, you know, phrase A plus phrase B plus my name, different languages, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be awful. It's going to be a mess, like a hot mess. So just have the whole phrase <laughs> and just include a placeholder in the right spot in each translation. And then it'll, it'll come up fine. So back, back to your recommendation where I said uh, you should have like the recommendation to have like a generic image and just change the, the text, yeah? So how you will do that with the stop sign? Yeah? So with the stop sign, I could have just had the red octagon and then had a text view over top of it that was centered in it. So in Android, there's like a relative layout where I could have just wrapped that image in a relative layout and put the text view and said center on parent equal true or like center on horizontal equal true. And it would have just centered it always right in with an above that octagon. And that's, that, that would have been better, right? Because I don't want to have to include so many different uh, versions of that stop sign. But then there's cases where you can't do that. So think about like the Staples uh, logo. Like in French, it's called Bureau en gros or something like that. Mm -hmm. and, and the Max Milk, it's, it translates to something else in French. And the logo, it like has that font built in. So you can't. So if you like have a list of like convenience stores or big box stores, you have to include the logos that have the name like in its special font, like embedded right within it. There's no working around it. But something like a simple stop sign, I could have easily not used uh, an image for that, but I wanted to, I was deriving an example of some sort, right, to show you the mess you could get into with using images that have localization. So. Then you have to use the image that's like globally recognized, yeah? If you go to China, I don't know if they know exactly. that. Exactly, exactly. The, the, the stop sign is a different shape in different <coughs> regions. In some regions, the stop sign, I think, is like a triangle instead of a yield sign. And yeah, in different colors even. So you have to account for that too. So it gets tricky. It's it's not an easy problem to solve. I mean, it, have to, it requires a lot of thought and research depending on what you're localizing. You had a question? Yeah, how are uh, Unicode characters getting put into these uh, text translation files? Like what kind of, like what are you talking about, like that? Well, letters that you need for other languages that are called Oh, you're just using coding, right? Like UTF coding. And the XML files support that. You should be fine. I mean, I know with Chinese, there's some, there can be some trickiness there. Um, but it's all supported in the .NET uh, resource files. So you should be fine as long as you, you do that. Any other questions? All right, so here's some resources if you want to look up um, how to localize your applications in iOS and Android using Xamarin or Xamarin Forms. I'll make the slide deck available afterwards, uh, and I'll post a link to it uh, in the meetup page so you can access it. And thank you for giving me this hour to talk to you. There's my uh, contact information. Definitely reach out if you have any further questions about this or about anything Xamarin related. Definitely be happy to talk to you. Thank you. Big scale. You have to be 13 or older to you. I don't know.